You know, ever since Apple dropped the M1 chip into the iPad Pro, I've been waiting patiently for some software which would actually allow me to use all of that performance. And here we are almost two years later, has Apple released iPad versions of Final Cut Pro or Logic Pro or any apps that can tap into the performance of M1? No, but they have started sticking the M2 chip into the iPad Pro. So now there's even more performance locked away inside your iPad, frustratingly just out of reach. That is until Blackmagic Design stepped up to the plate and released DaVinci Resolve for the iPad. Uh, not some special cut down version of Resolve, but the full desktop app. Now they have switched off some of the sections whilst they refine the user interface for iPad, but the whole app is there behind the scenes. In fact, we'll be using the hidden deliver section to do our rendering test a little bit later in the video. Uh, but basically now we've got a professional app that will allow us to see what the iPad can really do with its M chip. And to make this video more interesting, uh, let's just throw the Surface Pro 9 into the mix as well. Now, I know, I know people don't necessarily buy devices like this for professional video editing workflows, uh, if at all. In fact, perhaps this is a bit of a silly comparison, but let's have some fun. Because if these devices can tackle these workflows, who knows how that might influence buying decisions in the future. And we might just get some valuable insights on real world performance versus benchmarks because the i7 chip that's in this Surface Pro 9 has a total of 10 cores, eight low power cores and two hyper-threaded performance cores. And in Geekbench 5, it scores about the same as the M1 iPad for single core performance. And it's very similar to the M2 iPad Pro for multi-core. The onboard Iris XE graphics, they score about 10% lower in raw compute performance compared to this M1. So how will that translate into a real world test? And which of these apparently evenly matched tablets will come out on top? Let's do some geekery. So here's the test we're gonna do. We've created a two minute timeline in Resolve, which is broken down into four 30 second segments. And I'm using this test footage, which I shot in Blackmagic RAW at 4K 50 frames per second. And I've also transcoded the clip into H.264 and H.265. That allows us to create three identical timelines so that we can test each of those codecs. The first section of our timeline is the image that comes straight from the camera. But in the second section, we apply a basic color grade. In the third section, we're gonna take the same clip, we'll overlay it with translucency and scale it up a little. And then finally, we're gonna apply a lightweight mosaic effect to the overlaid clip. Uh, the idea here is really quite simple. The timeline just gets more difficult with each section. And by recording the time that's taken by each machine to render each section, we can determine the performance of each of the machines. And you'll want to hold on to the end because we've got a third wildcard setup, which will give you some more interesting insights. So we've got three different codecs, Blackmagic RAW or B-RAW, and we're using the constant quality Q5 version of the codec for this because it's the easiest for computers to handle. And then we've got H.264 and finally H.265 or HEVC. The M1 and M2 chips in the iPads have dedicated encoders and decoders for H.264 and 265 footage and so does the Intel chip in the Surface Pro. But neither machine has dedicated hardware to handle B-RAW, so that's going to be a pure GPU test. And we're gonna start now by looking at the timeline performance for editing. Uh, just bear in mind that we're using 4K footage at 50 FPS, and we're putting it onto a 4K timeline. And we haven't switched on any optimization. Normally, if you're doing this sort of thing on a laptop screen, you'd adjust the timeline proxy resolution to a half or a quarter to make things work much faster. But we're just gonna leave it on the brutal full resolution setting. Let's start with the iPad. It does surprisingly well with the first couple of sections of B-RAW footage, but the timeline performance noticeably begins to drop frames in the final two sections. When we look at H.264 and H.265, we see very nice playback. And that's testament to the performance of those dedicated decoders. But we do start seeing frame drops when we get to section four. Uh, over then to the Surface Pro 9, and it doesn't seem quite so well suited to the B-RAW footage. We're seeing frame drops from section two onwards, but perhaps that's not a surprise given that this is very reliant on GPU performance. And the iPad here simply has more under the hood. Uh, when it comes to H.264 and H.265, we're finding that the performance is also lagging behind the iPad. Again, we're seeing frame drops from section two onwards, and that would indicate that Intel's quick sync is not quite at the level of the M1's media engine. Of course, 
On either machine, we could simply change the timeline proxy resolution and we could work quite happily with this footage. But the real pain point will come when we want to render our timeline. Even if a professional video editor chose to do any editing on a device like this, they probably consider handing off the project to a more powerful machine in order to do the final render. But let's just assume that you need to do it all on device. Now we're going to keep our render settings the same for all three codecs. We'll output a YouTube friendly video at 1080p and 50 frames per second in the H.264 codec. So that means that our computers will have to decode the 4K source footage using their onboard decoders, or in the case of B-RAW, the GPU. Then they need to downsample the footage to 1080p and render in all of those timeline changes using the GPU. And finally, the footage is encoded to H.264 using the onboard encoders. Now, we tested the Surface Pro first with the H.264 source files. And I wasn't sure what to expect here, but it did seem to deliver reasonable frame rates on render for a device of this type, but I couldn't help feeling that it was a way off of M1 level performance based on my previous testing experience with Mac laptops. It finished the total render in five minutes, 54 seconds. Now, if you remember that each of the four sections of our timeline is 30 seconds long, that means that the final video will be two minutes. So five minutes, 54 seconds, doesn't seem like a very good score at all. In fact, that's an average of 16.9 frames per second rendered. But the first section you'll see was rendered at 74 frames per second. And once we added the color grade to the footage, we found that the render speed on the Surface Pro dropped all the way down to 25 FPS. Um, let's just compare it to the iPad doing the same render. And it's immediately apparent that the iPad is running much faster. It's around double the speed of the Surface Pro on the first three sections and it gets up to three times as fast on section four, so that it completes the render in two minutes, 21 seconds, with an average of 42.6 frames per second. That is way more usable. Now let's just take a moment here to recognize that we're doing this on a tablet, and that this is the M1 version of the iPad Pro, so you can expect even better performance from M2. And the fact that you have this much power in a tablet is surely gonna be of interest to video production professionals who might want to make quick edits on location or do a test color grade on set. It's really fantastic. Well, let's move on to H.265. Again, we'll use the Surface Pro 9 first. And we find it's much the same story as the H.264 footage. Uh, perfectly usable when the timeline is nothing more than a basic single stream edit, but performance falls off a cliff the moment that things get more complex. Our render completes in six minutes, two seconds, at an average of 16.6 .6 frames per second. Now the iPad will no doubt destroy the Surface Pro again, and sure enough, it looks that way as soon as we start the render. In fact, it only takes two minutes, 34 seconds to complete with an average of 39 frames per second. Another very solid victory here for the iPad. Uh, both machines were slightly slower dealing with H.265 compared to H.264, and that's pretty normal in my experience. What about the B-RAW though? This is a much tougher test. The Surface Pro starts out okay, hitting 47 frames per second whilst rendering section one, but it goes rapidly downhill from there and labors to completion in eight minutes, eight seconds with a rather depressing average of 12.3 frames per second. Uh, not a great result, but then this is a pretty silly test for a device like this. That said though, the iPad is the same type of device, so let's try rendering that B-RAW source footage. And again, we're seeing much higher render speeds from the iPad, and that shows in the completion time of four minutes, 16 seconds. That's an average of 23.4 frames per second. So let's draw some initial conclusions. First of all, this is a really valuable lesson in why you should never make a purchasing decision based solely on benchmark numbers. Different machines perform better for different tasks. When it comes to video work, the i7-1255U is no match for the M1, let alone the M2. Just as we wouldn't make purchasing decisions based solely on benchmarks, we also shouldn't make decisions solely on single tests like this. It's not safe to look at these results and conclude that the M1 or M2 would win every battle. Now that said, this is pretty disappointing given all the noise that Intel's been making about catching up and even overtaking Apple Silicon. And sure, it is a great improvement but in some areas, like the one we're testing, it's not there yet. In fact, in our case, it's not even close. There is another useful insight you might be able to extract from this video, and that is looking at how to read this data. 
Now, if you're looking to do basic video editing on your iPad, even at 4K, it's going to do the job fine. Sure, there are faster rendering options out there, but that's okay. Uh, look at the performance mainly of sections one and two. Whereas sections three and four give you an insight into how much slower things will get if you start to add layers, titles, and effects into the edit. And when we talk about layers, I'm talking about blending multiple sources together. And for most enthusiasts or YouTube editors, the iPad could actually do the job, so long as you're not too heavy on the titles and effects. And frankly, that's mind blowing. But if you're not a video editor and you're an M1 or M2 iPad owner, this means absolutely nothing to you. Now sure, it's nice to know that you've got a powerhouse of a chip inside your tablet, but for now, you can't make the most of it. Let's hope Apple brings some real world improvements to iPadOS and that we start to see more pro apps coming onto the market. Now, Surface Pro 9 may have had its ass handed to it by the iPad in this test, but the Surface Pro does run the full version of Windows, and that means that you can access every bit of performance in that i7 chip. And contrary to what this test might lead you to believe, there's a lot of performance on offer. And the iPad won this test because of its superior encoders and decoders, and because of its GPU. Thanks to unified memory, the GPU has fast access to the same memory space as the CPU, and that makes a huge difference in these type of applications. With the Surface Pro, even though the onboard Iris Xe GPU can access up to 8GB of the RAM, it just can't work as fast as the M1. Both tablets we're using have 16GB of RAM by the way, so you will find that results may be different on the 8GB models. Now, you could stop watching here, but there's a wild card that I want to throw into the mix. You see, the Surface Pro 9 has Thunderbolt ports, and it runs Windows, so that means we can plug in an eGPU. I'm using my Razer Core X Chroma eGPU enclosure, and inside is an AMD 5700 XT GPU. Not the fastest graphics card by today's standards, but it does have significantly more performance on offer than either of these tablets do. So can we use the eGPU with the Surface Pro 9 to get better results? Now, if you're not familiar with eGPU, you need to know a couple of things. Firstly, there will always be bottlenecks due to Thunderbolt. So we won't be able to access the full performance of the graphics card. And secondly, the improvement that you do see will depend heavily on the type of work that you're doing. Thirdly, best results are seen when you plug a display into the eGPU. Whilst you can accelerate the internal display of your device in some circumstances, this requires sending a lot of data to the eGPU and receiving it back again. But if you use an external display, the data flow is predominantly one way to the eGPU and then onto the display. Now, this is why eGPUs work so well for gaming. The 3D data itself is not that intensive. It's uh, sent to the eGPU and it's the graphics card that then does the hard work of rendering it in whatever resolution you need. Uh, but with video, the benefit that you see will be a lot less because we've got a huge amount of video data that we have to send across that single connection. Now we are using DaVinci Resolve Studio on the Surface Pro here. This is the paid version of Resolve, so it supports multi-GPU setups. And it detects our eGPU fine and will auto-select it for use. Uh, but there is a setting that we want to change. In the app preferences, you'll notice that it defaults to using the Intel QuickSync decoder. And that's going to be a problem for us because it will mean more data traveling over Thunderbolt, whilst the eGPU and the Intel decoder work together. So even though I know the AMD decoders may not be as good as the Intel QuickSync decoders, selecting AMD will mean less data copying and therefore less bandwidth going over the Thunderbolt connection. And this can and does make a big difference. So now that we're all set up, we can take a look at timeline performance. And actually you'll find it doesn't really improve that much for the B-RAW timeline, but the H.264 and H.265 timelines are now smooth on all of the sections. So that's a good start but let's do some rendering. And we'll start with the H.264 source footage, where we find the slowest performance yet rendering the first section. It manages just 48.1 FPS. Uh, there is a reason for this though, keep watching. The second section hits 49.2 FPS, and the third is 48.4, the fourth is 49.8. Or to put it another way, all the sections are the same within a margin of error. We're getting nowhere near the full performance of the 5700 XT. This is a bottleneck due to the Thunderbolt connection with the eGPU. And it's just part of the nature of working with eGPUs. They don't work in every scenario. But I wouldn't say it isn't working here, because if you look at the total render time, it was the fastest of the day at 2 minutes 2 seconds. 
The story is the same with H265, and by the same, I mean exactly the same. It also took two minutes, two seconds. So whilst the performance is bottlenecked at 49 FPS, it's still much faster than the Surface Pro alone or the iPad when it comes to the more complex sections of the timeline. Let's try the B-roll timeline for good measure. And here we're still affected by bottlenecks. I can assure you that a PC fitted with a 5700 XT would achieve better results, but the eGPU makes a difference from section two onwards. And again, it is the fastest overall, finishing in three minutes, 30 seconds, at an average of 28.6 frames per second. Now, just to be clear, I'm not for a moment advocating that you should go and buy a Surface Pro and then an eGPU to do video editing work. It's just a bit of fun to show what's possible. And it's also helpful to see the principles of video editing in Resolve and where different types of hardware can come in and make a difference. Uh, we'll throw up all of these charts again at the end of the video so you can take your time to pause and digest the data. You'll see that eGPU does make a big difference, but only when you're working with more complex video. The main thing really here I'm still trying to wrap my head around is the thought that all of this has been possible with these types of devices. Apple Silicon has moved the computing goalposts and it's lit a fire under the PC competition. We're seeing better iPads, better Macs, but we're also seeing better chips from Intel and AMD, and that's great for everybody. So I hope you enjoyed this bit of silly testing. Thanks as always for the subs, the shares, the comments, the likes, and even the dislikes. See you again soon for some more geekery.